Today I'm going to make my first injection mold for the Morgan. Welcome to another episode. I had been laser cutting uh, some parts out of clear acrylic, as you can see here. And there are a few things I didn't like about using this uh, clear acrylic. One is I hate cutting acrylic on a laser cutter. And the reason I hate cutting acrylic on a laser cutter is because the fumes. I don't like the fumes. One of the things I discovered is that uh, my eyes were starting to water. I have a fan, an exhaust fan, that does a really good job of exhausting the fumes outside. But it doesn't exhaust all of the fumes. And so there were enough residual fumes that it was really bothering me. So I decided to make an injection mold for this part instead of laser cutting them. And the part is too large for me to make in this machine. And on this machine, there's plenty of size for the part, but the, the clamp itself is only two tons, I believe, and that's not quite enough for this part. All of the molds that I've made so far have been parting line molds. This is the parting line here, the surface. So in other words, when I put the, the two molds half together, the parting line is a flat plane that represents the difference between the core and the cavity side of the mold. And then the plastic is injection, injected through the parting line itself. The Morgan, on the other hand, injects the plastic through the back of the mold or the top and then into the mold itself. This is done with a tapered sprue right here, which uh, I will show you on the computer in more detail. And then the bottom is a gate. This is what I'm going to use uh, for my mold. There is a tether, another type of mold where the large side is on the bottom instead of the top as it is here. So this would be smaller than you see now, and then it would be much larger on the bottom leading into a runner. And then the sprue comes out this way from the mold. For molds where the sprue comes out the, the, the top or the back, the Morgan comes with the sprue bushing. And let me show you a close-up. You can see there are some dimples along here. And the purpose of the dimples are so that when you take this mold out of the machine, you can twist this and it will grab onto the sprue here and then twist it off at the gate. So then you can just pull it out and then open the mold and pull the part out. And you'll see that once I get the, my mold built and working. Both of these molds came with the machine and they're both uh, a type of mold that is useful for small runs. You pull the mold out of the machine to remove the part and then you have to put the mold back in the machine. And you can see the sprue bushing fits on both of them. So I use the same sprue bushing and just move it from one to the other. This is the injection mold that consists of two halves plus the sprue bushing that I modeled up. I'm going to start by doing a cross-section analysis of the top so that you can see how this works. And I'm trying to get close to the center there. This shows you how we have a bushing on the top and then we have this taper down here. And You'll notice that this taper, the starting diameter is a little bit less than the sprue. And that's because the sprue may not be aligned perfectly, or I should say the bushing. And we want this to be able to push out through the top. This then comes down to a ball end. And then this is the gate that injects directly into the part. So if I hide the, the bottom, you can see the back of the part and you can see how this is injecting the plastic directly into the middle of the part itself. Let me turn off the analysis and then turn back on the cavity and get rid of the two parts here and just give you a quick overview of how I made the mold. Uh, so the mold has the part here and then I just did a boolean operation to remove that to cut out that part. Over here I have air vents at the extremes. So the plastic is going to be injected right here and then flow along this way. 
And so I wanted the error to be able to escape at the extremes. These are about 1.5 thousandths of an inch deep right there, which is not thick enough for the plastic to flow through it. And then this is deeper here just to, to make sure that the air doesn't have any resistance going through the rest of the vent. These are screw slots because I'm going to use uh, screwdrivers to pry the mold halves apart. And then this is for the alignment pins, which are just quarter inch uh, dowel pins. So it's a fairly straightforward mold to make. And uh, the next thing was to do the cam operations, which are all fairly straightforward except for how I did the sprue itself up here. So this part is fairly straightforward. It's just, you know, cutting out the pocket. And then here is where things got a little bit interesting. Probably the best way to do this uh, from what other people have told me is to use a tapered reamer. I didn't have one at the time, but I did happen to have long reach 1 8 inch diameter end mills, both ball and flat end. So I used a flat end mill to cut the, most of the pocket. And then I used a ball end mill to make the sides smooth. And I used horizontal passes because I want to be able to twist this and then pull it out. So these two operations, as you'll see, worked quite well. There was a little bit of chatter I could hear, probably because the end mills were sticking out so long, but it did work. On the back side, we have the gate. And so there are two operations that are used to cut the gate. The first one is this contour operation, which is using a 1 32nd inch flat end mill, goes and cuts out the pocket here, or the gate, I should say, uh, up to the part that was cut with the 1 8 inch ball end mill. So if we take a look at that operation, the bottom is set to right there with a, an offset of uh, negative uh, ten thousandths of an inch to make sure that it cuts all the way through. And then there's a second operation using a one thirty second inch, roughly, uh, ball in mill. And that smooths the surfaces a little bit. Plus it also just kisses this edge here. So if there are any burrs that are left over, it uh, removes the, the burr there. It's kind of like a miniature chamfer, but uh, without actually modifying the geometry. Uh, the rest of the cat operations are fairly straightforward. Um, it takes a little while because I'm having to go all the way down to 1 32nd inch end mills to remove the material in these sections here. I started with the bottom half and then I want to hit it to make sure that it's set all the way on the parallels and I'm making sure that the parallels don't move. I cut the stock longer than I needed so this is milling it to length. This is using a 3 16th inch diameter alu power end mill, which is really great for milling aluminum to rough out the pocket. If you look closely, you may notice that this is a really small diameter long end mill. This is a 1 32nd inch diameter flat end mill, cleaning up the uh, bottom. Now we're cleaning up the sidewalls, and you can see that it's milling the teeth, which couldn't be milled with larger end mills. Okay, it looks good. Now what I'm going to do is uh, flip it over, and then I have some features I need to do on the back side. At this point, I, I moved the uh, zero to here. It used to be over here. So I'll just pick up these two corners, and I don't have to pick up the height because it's pretty much the same. Plus, the features back here, which is just one in the center, is not very precise. What this is uh, cutting right now is the alignment hole that is on the bottom. This alignment hole goes on top of a alignment screw that is on the Morgan, and that will ensure that I put the mold back in pretty much the same place each time, so the nozzle would be aligned. I finished up the, the second side uh, off camera, 
And what I'm going to do now is flip it over and uh, mill it back. And the back is where it, it, it may be, it's probably hard to see, but there's a tiny hole here, which is the gate. And then when I flip it over, it's going to mill the, uh, the tapered sprue that goes from the back and feeds into the gate. The uh, back, uh, the zero point is here, which is, uh, it was over here before, so when I flipped it over, it's moved to here to make sure that it's accurate. And now I'm going to uh, mill out the part here for the plastic uh, to come in. This is uh, milling the section where the screw guide will sit in place. This is using the long reach 1 8 inch flat end mill and if you listen you can hear the screeching. The next one is going to be uh, the ball end mill and it also screeches a little. So I know that it worked because uh, there's no uh, coolant left in here. It all drained down through the pocket. Pull it out now and have a look. but. Um, should be ready to put in the machine and give it a try. Here's the, the center of the plate and uh, the diagram showed a pin in here and it turns out it's just a screw, a low profile screw. So all I have to do is screw this in here and that will give me the alignment that I need. And now if I take my mold and put it on there and see how it fits. Perfect. So that means I can put the sprue bushing in here and now what I can do is adjust the, the height with the toggle clamp. So I see I need to go up a few inches so I'll release the clamp. To make it easier to move this up and down I created a, a 3D printed part that goes onto a regular hex wrench with a, a handle that rolls. So now I can put this in here. Okay, I think that was about an inch. Let's see how it is. Yeah, I have another few inches to go. Okay, well, I didn't see that coming. It's all the way up and uh, it doesn't fit. So what I've discovered is that I need a spacer to make it thicker. So I found a, a piece of one and a half inch thick aluminum, which is uh, three inches wide. So it's the same width as the mold. And it turns out that this is just enough so that uh, when I clamp it, Not quite. Okay, so I need to uh, put it down a little bit. Okay, that clamped nicely. So I've turned on the machine and uh, I'm going to give it a try as soon as it warms up. I'm waiting for it to heat up. You can see that the nozzle temperature is up to where I want it to, which is uh, 475 roughly. But the barrel is still warming up. The target for this, I think, is, let's see what it is, it's 460. So it has a little bit of uh, distance to go. I've also set the clamp pressure to a little bit less than 8 tons, which is the maximum I can use without uh, changing the configuration. And then I've started with the, the injection pressure low, and I'll raise that. Uh, to try out different things as I go along. The barrel is pretty much uh, up to temperature now, so I'll grab this piece of plastic, close this, and now I can uh, clamp it.
and it didn't um, I didn't get the clunk so I need to uh, <clears throat> lower this just a little bit there we go <clears throat> so let's uh, give it a try Okay, <clears throat> so you can see the uh, polypropylene came out and uh, it's all over the place. So I'll release the clamp. Oops. Well, then I have to have this closed to release the clamp. And uh, I'm going to let that cool off. Okay, let's have a look here. So first I'll break off the uh, sprue. And the sprue came out completely, which is great, and it also comes out of the bushing, so that part worked. Now let's uh, pull this apart um, and see what we have. So, no problems filling, um, but not enough clamping force. So, what that means is I need to uh, drop the injection pressure a little bit. So let me pull this out and you see no problem at all coming out. I was having a lot of problems with flashing. In other words, the pressure was sufficient to push the mold halves apart and the plastic was coming out the sides. I had the injection pressure all the way down as far as I could go and it would still work. It seems like uh, two on that scale for injection pressure is the lowest I could go. And that wasn't low enough, at least that's what I thought. And then I discovered that there's, uh, or remembered I should say, there's another control on the machine. Let me show you that. This control right here is a flow control valve. And I have it right there at the moment, which it turned out to work pretty well. This had been backed out quite a few turns. And what I did is I uh, slowly moved this in more and more until it got to the point where the injection was slow enough that it wouldn't push the two mold halves apart. And so what I've learned with this machine is that the speed of injection is really important with molds like the one that I was creating. And that is what made the difference between success and failure. What I've used so far was polypropylene, which is what I had in the machine. But that's not the material I wanted to use. I wanted to switch to ABS. So I've put some ABS in the machine, run it through a bunch of cycles. This is some black ABS. And after adjusting the pressure, uh, I should say the, the injection speed, I am now getting shots that work pretty well. And there we have it, a successful shot. There is some discolorization discolorization um, that I think might be a result of uh, some of the, the previous material still in there or temperature. I'm going to need to have a look. But uh, as you can see, it turned out pretty well. The part turned out quite nicely. Let me see if I can give you a close up. You can see it has a fairly smooth surface. The tooling marks do show up. Uh, it may be a little bit hard to see in this. But I have some ideas about how to deal with that. First one is I can put the mold back in and with one thirty second in flat end mill, I could run that with much smaller step overs. And that will do a really good job of making the tool marks disappear, I believe. I'm going to try that. 
If that doesn't work, then the other thing I can do is use some sandpaper and other abrasives to polish the tooling marks out. They're small enough that they shouldn't be an issue. One thing I did do is I changed the toolpath from one side to the other. So the toolpath is much more obvious on one side than it is on the other. And the difference is I decreased the step over. So in the first one, the step over, I think it was about uh, 20 thousandths of an inch. And on the second one, it was uh, 12 thousandths of an inch, something like that. And that makes the tool marks much less obvious. So what I want to do is put it back into the machine, which I'll do later, and use a step over of maybe a couple thousandths of an inch. If that doesn't get rid of the tool marks, at that point, it should be really easy to polish them out. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please give me a thumbs up, subscribe, comment below, and I'll see you next time.